Welcome to our Palm Sunday worship service online here at Salem Lutheran. So glad that you have joined us. I hope you and your family are doing well. As we enter into Holy Week, we will continue our online worship. Monday, Thursday and Good Friday will be available to you uh, as those days approach. Uh, Easter Sunday will also be available in Easter Sunday morning. And we will have a communion service afterward, just like we did last week. And uh, if you need a communion kit, uh, we are more than we are more than happy to deliver one to you. If you have bread and wine or grape juice at home, you can use your own communing yourself with those. So I hope that you will join us on Easter uh, as well. And I hope for you and your family a blessed Holy Week and Easter next Sunday. So welcome to our worship services. We begin our service in the back of the church with the procession of the palms. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the Son of David. The Lord be with you. And also with you. A reading from St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna oh, in the highest.
O King, as we enter this Holy Week, we become acutely aware of our shortcomings and failures. On Sunday, we sing our praise, and before the music has left the air, we are already insulting you as we curse the things of this world that do not go our way. Cleanse us of our sin and show us how to honor you in all that we say and do. Amen. Despite our sin, we are loved by a king who has given everything for us. And still this king offers more. Our merciful God grants forgiveness of all sin and welcomes us into the heavenly kingdom of the gift of Jesus Christ, our reigning Lord. Amen. Amen. prophet Jonah, the fourth chapter. Once again, uh, preface to our reading is that uh, the Ninevites had repented, God gave them mercy, and they responded with uh, sackcloths and ashes, returning back to their better ways. But this was dis very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city. And made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals?
Dear friends in Christ, I wish you God's peace and love on this Palm Sunday celebration day. And you might be wondering about now, what in the world does Jonah have to do with Palm Sunday? How in the world could we connect Jonah to Palm Sunday and the Passion Story? Well, there's actually some very interesting parallels going on because we have um, this great act of celebration uh, Nineveh repent, repents, Jerusalem celebrates, but it's met with a great anger from those, uh, even though this is the great act of redemption. So, God's compassion meets Jonah's anger today. What makes you angry? What makes you fume? Is it politics? Injustice? School bullying? Oh. For Oli, it's fishing. See, Oli is a passionate fisherman. He never likes to be outfished. In fact, he carries one of those little counters out on the lake or the stream. And he and Sven were out fishing one day, and Lena is catching all kinds of things, and Oli and Sven are not catching a thing. You know, she said, Would you go ask Lena what she's doing? Sven says, no, you go ask Lena what she's doing. I'm not going to go over and ask her what she's doing. His oldie says, no, 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 I'm the fisherman. I'm not going to count out Lena. Sven finally says, okay, all right, I'll go over and see what Lena is doing. So he comes back and Oli says, well, Sven, Sven, what, what was she doing? She said, well, Oli, at first you got to cut the hole in the ice. Will Rogers, the humorist, poignantly once said, people who fly into a rage always make a bad landing. From a more profound sense, Sister Elizabeth Kenny said, he who angers you conquers you. And then with a little humor, our friend Phyllis Dillard said, Never go to bed mad. Stay up and fight. Jonah is angry, flying into a rage, but burrowed underneath his anger, fear slinks through the tunnels like a gopher. I'm so mad I want to die. I've heard that from many teenagers and pray that it's an overreaction. Sometimes it's not. I'm rather befuddled that Jonah just preached this message of hope and all the people of Nineveh repented, wouldn't this be cause of celebration? Just the idea of somebody listening to me excites me. Wow, the congregation listened. Hallelujah, the whole city's been transformed. It is Palm Sunday, we're celebrating, cheering crowds, save us, save us, they scream out. Why doesn't Jonah ride the donkey and live the dream? But he's livid instead. Jonah wants to exact revenge. Jonah wants his country recompensed for damages. Jonah isn't interested in God's mercy. In fact, he resents it. I ask you, if ISIS or the Taliban repented, would we be satisfied? I can hear the cynicism already. Oh, they're just saving their own skins. They're just changing their minds so they can get a foothold and do more damage. We cannot trust them. Ever. As a side note, you know, this social distancing thing has reduced the amount of terrorist actions. There's no crowds to attack anymore. I guess there are some good things in this after all. But Jonah wants stability. He wants a national identity. Jonah doesn't want Nineveh to receive God's goodness. Like the older brother in that parable that we've been using along the way with the prodigal son, he's terribly upset, terribly jealous. He demands reward for being the good son. He's entitled. He's the good child of the family. The one who cared for the others, who cared for the siblings while the younger son was out gallivanting in the countryside visiting Las Vegas. He took on the responsibilities and this burrowing anger seethed in Jerusalem the day Jesus came in. See, the city was filled on Palm Sunday 
With all the folks coming in for the Passover, the city was bursting at its seams. The Jews were making their pilgrimage to the Holy Temple, but the occupational forces of Rome and the governor Pontius Pilate are disadvantaged by sheer volume. They worry that a massive riot could explode at any moment. And Jesus appears to rile the crowd riding on a donkey. Salvation has, uh, has arrived in Jerusalem but the plot against Jesus has already begun. The plot against God's mercy has already commenced. By the next Sunday, Jesus will lay in the tomb. The religious authorities do not want God's mercy. They want stability over justice. They want quiet oppression disguised as peace because those who are oppressed cannot rise up. And so Jesus comes into Jerusalem this week. He turns over the money changers' tables. He heals on the Sabbath. He steals the thunder from the religious authorities. He calls out their hypocrisy. They're angry. They're angry. Jonah is angry. How could this God of ours be merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love concerning enemies? That's all right concerning me. My enemies are your enemies, right? Dear Lord, instead of celebrating the greatest story on earth, an entire people who did evil have repented, Jonah would rather have revenge. Before we get ourselves ahead, let's not be naive either. There's a place for God's justice and law. We don't believe that God simply lets people off the hook. The murderer may convert in the darkness of his cell, but it doesn't mean he's allowed to go free. See, repentance, the act of contrition, takes accountability for our past actions. The slate might be wiped clean through Jesus, but the murderer's conversion should enlighten him to the evil he's done and the recompense that needs to be made. The murderer does receive God's grace. Nineveh does receive God's mercy. But Nineveh's repentance means she takes account for her past actions. But God, or but Jonah is mad at God because God's opened his heart to these people. They don't deserve it. What is really important to us can evoke fits of anger. Something that we're invested in, truly passionate about, will make us mad. See, Jonah's real God is not Yahweh, but it's Israel, the nation, the country, the boundaries, the geography, the ethnicity. The threat to Israel makes him mad when God would have mercy. We can retaliate, we can punish, we can even score. We can teach someone a lesson, because that's our natural reaction, isn't it? If somebody bullies a child, especially if it's your child, we're ready for a fight. We're angry as a disturbed beehive. But God somehow or another breaks through this because he wants to rebuild our relationships. As he came into Jerusalem that day, Jesus laments, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. For Jesus comes to Jerusalem and laments. He has compassion on the people. These are the same people who will kill him, not only killing the prophets, but will kill him as well. But instead of Jonah, who runs out of the city and hides, Jesus chooses to face the anger of the people. For to the thief, he declares, today you will be with me in paradise. To the centurion, the crucifiers, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. God asked Jonah, you care so much about that bush. And you had nothing to do with its 
growing. Yet you resent me for caring for 120,000 people whom I created. Anger blinds Jonah. Sometimes our anger reveals our fears. Fury displays our real passions, and for Jonah, that's his country. What gives us meaning and purpose, the ultimate concern, is our God. But as Christians, we maintain our identity to nation, ethnicity, family, community, gender, but most fundamentally, our connection is our humanity, sinners saved by grace. Our self-worth is not in what we've achieved, what we've created, what we've begun, but what we've re re received, undeserving. We may be flawed and lost, but in Christ we are accepted and delighted in. For our passion story resides at the corner of anger and compassion. And Jonah's story ends, like many things in life, with no apparent resolution we live today in the unknown. We don't know how this pandemic will end. But we have confidence. We have confidence that God continues to come back to us and not give up on us. And we have a place in the New Jerusalem where there will be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more grief, no more pandemics, no more anger. And we will be with God forever. Amen. And now may the God who passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds on Christ Jesus. Amen.
kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our service today begins with the procession of the palms, Jesus entering into Jerusalem. And now we move to the reading of our Passion story as we enter into Holy Week. The Passion story as recorded in St. Matthew. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. But Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards in order to see how this would end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last two came forward and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, he deserves death. And they spat in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him. And she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you are also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know the man. At that moment the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said, Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. Now Jesus stood before the governor. And the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Yeah. 
Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way.
Some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. 
Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee.